There does seem to be this close connection between kids and frogs. I don't know what it is. It might be just the fact that we can catch them as kids. You can catch them, you can hold them, you can look at them, and you can let them go. Maybe it's something about their life cycle where you can see like a distinction between you know the baby frog versus the adult frog, and they go through such a significant change. I mean, they're kind of these amazing creatures, especially the yellow-legged frogs, which have such an interesting life cycle where they can be a tadpole for up to four years. And they do that so they can get nice and big. So historically, mountain yellow-legged frogs occurred in both streams and lakes in the Sierra Nevada from about 5,000 feet all the way almost to the tops of the mountains, so up to about 12,000 feet. The frogs were everywhere. And then with the introduction of trout, those frogs disappeared. Most people come here for all these amazing waterfalls. Like you've got Yosemite Falls, you've got Vernal Nevada Falls, and if you follow up any drainage, you're gonna hit some spectacular waterfall. They're amazing waterfalls, but we also look at them and we're like, well, those are amazing fish barriers because there's no trout species that can get to the top of Yosemite Falls. In the Sierra Nevada, we've got 12,000 or so lakes. Almost all of them were naturally fishless. And instead of fish, you had mountain yellow-legged frogs as the top predator. And then with the introduction of fish, you changed all of that. Fish stocking started in the Sierra in about 1860, and it started in a pretty simple way, basically just taking fish from low elevation streams where they were native, putting them in a bucket, and carrying them a few miles upstream. It progressed from that to packing fish into the backcountry on horses. And then the really big change came just after World War II, which was the advent of aerial fish docking. With the crew on board, the flight into the rugged mountains is underway. Just after takeoff, the pilot sets his course for the first drop point. The plane drops rapidly toward the lake at a high speed. The hopper is open and the spray containing the fingerlings falls toward the surface of the lake. It sounds totally improbable, but it in fact works. 30 million fish were stocked into Yosemite National Park in the matter of about 40 years. And those fish had these tremendous unintended consequences. And we stocked them primarily for recreational purposes. We wanted people to move out and experience the wilderness, and we thought the best way to do that was to stock these lakes with non-native trout. They started realizing pretty early on that when you have fish stocked in the lakes, you start losing other species, and most noticeably was the Sierra Nevada yellow-legged frog. Rainbow trout, and brook trout, brown trout, they're all generalist predators, so they'll eat pretty much anything that will fit in their mouths. There's no question that you can't have fish and frogs in the same water body and have the frog population thrive. You have to get rid of the fish from certain places to recover the frogs. We had developed a method of removing fish from at least some lakes, and within five or so years, you had thousands of frogs oftentimes. The future of frogs looked pretty bright at that point in time, but it was a naive optimism. There was another major threat affecting the frogs, and that was the amphibian chytrid fungus. It's a fungus that's sort of affecting amphibian populations worldwide. It's this invasive skin disease. Uh, we started discovering chytrid in Yosemite in the 70s, and that's when we started seeing these massive die-offs. For a lot of years, a lot of people kept saying we're just circling the drain of extinction. We had no ability to control what this fungus was doing, and what it was doing was wiping out this frog. In 2014, mountain yellow-legged frogs went from being a declining species to an officially endangered species. We know we can remove the fish from selected places. We can't do that with the fungus. So if the frogs are going to survive, they have to be able to survive despite that fungus. And that's what we're seeing in Yosemite right now. 
these remnant populations that made it through the arrival of the chytrid fungus in the 70s and 80s and 90s, those populations are now beginning to really expand. We're taking populations that are chytrid positive, so they have the chytrid mycosis disease, but they don't seem to be succumbing to the disease. So we go out and we capture our individuals from a service population and we'll either package them up and put them on a helicopter and then fly them to our sites or we'll put them in backpacks and we'll hike them to our sites. And that's worked really well. We've developed populations now all over Yosemite that are surviving where two generations of frogs before were dying off because of the chytrid fungus. I think now it's actually ending up to be a pretty hopeful story. Until about 10 years ago, no one had ever translocated a mountain yellow legged frog. So it's a real team effort. We've had funding from the National Park Service, the National Science Foundation. The Yosemite Conservancy has been critical in that effort, providing us funding year after year to do some of the science and the hands-on management. It's a small price to pay to recover an animal that was probably the most abundant vertebrate in the Sierra Nevada historically. Those frogs played a really important role in this ecosystem, and places like Yosemite, where habitats are largely intact, are critical for the recovery of this frog.